Hello, my name is Dr. Mark Allendary. I'm the Medical Director of Infectious Diseases and Chief Innovation Officer for Access Health Louisiana. I live in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I also serve as the co-chair for the ACOI Infectious Diseases Subspecialty Section. Now, you've seen me do these updates now for the past few months, and in conjunction with the leadership of the ACOI, uh, I hope that these messages are helping you to keep up with the latest on COVID-19. I know many of you are in the thick of the fight, and I'd like to thank you on behalf of all of us who focus on infectious diseases for a living, and certainly on behalf of the ACOI. Moving forward and together with the ACOI, we will continue to share information as it becomes available, as well as some of the hopeful progress that we are seeing. Okay, so now on to some of the stories. So let's talk about this really, really, really important, this really important study um, that uh, uh, came out uh, this week. It was in uh, uh, Nature, uh, uh, the journal Nature, and it was focusing essentially on o occupancy uh, limits. Okay, so what did it say? So basically, uh, who knew that cell phones, cell phones, who knew that cell phones, when they were created, that they play such a telling role in analyzing the transmission of a virus during a global pandemic? But that's what researchers are using to analyze what is happening during this pandemic. They look back on the, s the, the, the transmission of COVID-19 in the spring and are looking at cell phone data to make some future predictions. And they've come up with some interesting conclusions. But first, a bit about the study. It's centered around using cell phone data from one in three Americans. That means one in three of you that are watching this, your cell phone was used. The researchers used a model that mapped hourly movements of nearly 100 million people, right? That's about a third. Uh, and the model uh, could create a real trajectory um, and could predict that a small amount of super spreader points of interest account for a large majority of infections. And we've talked about that here on this video blog several times. But here are some really interesting highlights of the study. Now, what they found was that restricting mac maximum occupancy at each point of interest uh, uh, is more effective uh, than trying to reduce the number, uh, I'm sorry, that's trying to reduce, uh, more effective than trying to reduce the movements of a population. So for example, let's take a point of interest like a restaurant or a bar. Uh, in other words, it's better to set ceiling caps on how many people can be in the restaurant or bar at one time rather than closing them all together. Now, the model also predicts higher infection rates amongst racial and socioeconomic groups, and the difference is, socio uh, is solely from a mobility standpoint, since they found that vulnerable groups that have uh, not been able to reduce mobility as sharply than the places they visit are more crowded and therefore at higher risk. And of course, this makes complete sense in everything that we've been seeing and reporting on during the pandemic, uh, uh, specifically with this uh, video blog, uh, when we talked about that low wage or low income workers are uh, unlikely to be able to, uh, to work at home or have that luxury from doing so. Uh, and of course, uh, for example, they're visiting areas that may be more crowded, like a grocery store, uh, compared to uh, you know maybe one that would be out in more rural areas. Now, the article also points out that cell phone records, of course, don't reveal race and ethnicity or income of their users, but the models were still able to predict higher infection rates, again, amongst communities of color, as well as those that are in lower, so lower socioeconomic groups. And that was, of course, based on census data. Now, the policies the scientists are recommending to lawmakers are to assist those who are most disadvantaged. The policies the scientists are recommending to lawmakers are to assist those that are most disadvantaged. Hmm. I think it's a great idea. And don't have the luxuries that higher income groups do. Now, that means not only capping occupancy, for example, at grocery stores, but to make food available to low-income individuals by opening uh, emergency food distribution centers. And they're also asking to have testing more widely available in high-risk neighborhoods. Now, they're also pushing for better paid leave policy. I support that. For people who can't work from home uh, or have some form of income support so people can stay home when they are sick. I 100% support that. Now, for essential workers, they encourage better infection prevention in their workplaces, including high-quality PPE, the best ventilation that you can have, and distancing whenever possible. Now, the way I see it, uh, as COVID continues to unmask, how socioeconomic realities have once again put black and brown communities in a precarious health scenario time and time again as this pandemic goes on. 
it just spotlights that we have big problems to solve. And once the pandemic is behind us, uh, and if we don't solve the issues and disparities in our, vul in our vulnerable communities soon, we will just see the same scenario play out again during the next public health emergency. And I think one thing that I have said time and time again is that one of the promises uh, and one of the big lessons that we need to recognize uh, when we leave, um, when, we get, when, when COVID-19 is behind us, is that we need to make a collective promise um, uh, that uh, we will uh, do what we can as a medical society to root out systemic discrimination and racism that exists within the healthcare system. I'm going to also add misogyny and trans and homophobia, but for this article, uh, we'll talk about systemic uh, discrimination. Okay, so <laughs> let's talk about masking. But before we talk about masking, one of the most important things that you can do is masking. Um, let's talk about how there has been a tremendous amount of cases that are happening in the country right now. I mean, it is horrific what we're seeing. Um, just yesterday, we had the highest number of cases. Um, and what we're seeing essentially is a record for U.S. hospitalizations, and they're topping out at about 61,000 right now. So last week, we talked about the pandemic numbers uh, and how they're increasing. And this week, uh, officials are reporting that hospitalizations in the U.S. hit an all-time high of 61,694 just this past Tuesday. So let's just uh, let's round up 62,000 uh, cases. Um, and uh, the cases... Uh, daily cases are surpassing 140,000 for the first time. We are now at a point where the peak hospitalization numbers that we saw of nearly 60,000, which occurred in April, have now been surpassed. The U.S. reported 140,000 cases for one day uh, just yesterday. And El Paso, Texas, which has a population of 680,000, now has more people hospitalized with COVID-19 than most of the states do. They were at 1,100 as of Tuesday, and they've resorted to having to double the city supply of mobile morgues. Oy. Um, they are setting up field hospitals at downtown convention centers and airlifting ICU patients to other cities. Please, <laughs> this is this is as great. And, and let me also just say this: this is the beginning. Like we're gonna look back and say, oh yeah, remember when we had 61,000 people in the hospitals? Um, and you know, one thing that I've said um, many times since the beginning of this uh, uh, pandemic is that the uh, the the medical system has always relied on the public health system to be working functionally. Because if the public health system wasn't working functionally, we'd have an overrun um, uh, on the hospital beds, and that's certainly what we're seeing right now. Okay, so now there are severe shortages of medical personnel uh, in too many locations, so much so that in Wisconsin, they are now closing down testing sites so they can move personnel to focus on bedside care. Dr. Sanjay Gupta from CNN just reported that the rate that this disease is accelerating has moved, uh, has moved it in his mind from a health crisis to a humanitarian crisis, and he called it one of the worst stories he's ever covered in his career at CNN. CNN is also reporting that some hospitals have reached full capacity and are sending patients away. And doctors are pleading with the public to get more serious about wearing masks, washing hands, and physical distancing. It's what we've been saying all along. Wear masks. Although these, these little neck masks are not the best, but I, 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 I wear these when I walk around outside and I keep masks when I'm indoors. All right. In fact, the CDC, in an updated scientific briefing, also happened, uh, which happened this past Tuesday, also uh, say that wearing a mask also protects the wearer and not just people. And that's a huge change from the CDC. So let this sink in. The U.S. has more hospitalized, uh, uh, has more more people hospitalized with COVID-19 this week than at any other point in the pandemic. And they're saying the main difference is, is that before uh, there were hot spots in the country, meaning healthcare workers from one area uh, where the pandemic wasn't as bad could travel to other areas of the country to help out. And this is no longer looking like a viable option. So folks, we need to do our best to make sure that everybody is masking, masking, masking. That is single-handedly one of the most, if not the most important uh, intervention that we could do uh, to not only prevent transmission, but we have to recognize that our fellow healthcare workers, you, myself, 
um, are uh, potentially uh, being put at risk uh, as a result of, uh, of the, the virus that is now uh, in stages of transmission that I, uh, that I would have never thought possible. Okay, so let's uh, stay on the lookout for these regular updates and to read more from the sources used in this report, go to the ACOI.org forward slash COVID-19. Together with the ACY, we'll help you have the latest information to help you respond to your patients and stay on top of the crisis. And please, please feel free to reach out to me anytime at madairy at mac.com. Please stay safe. We can do this together.